Okay then. So uh, let me let me start. I hope that you will see the presentation that we did for you. I do know and I do understand that many of you have already started, but out of our experience, we know uh, that for sure that um, sometimes it's really good to take a step back and see if there are any little points that you might miss uh, at the very beginning of your journey and were actually very important and might give you a, a really um, important clues and, and traces on where to look for your family information. Yeah. So let's 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 start. Polish ancestry, how to start? Um, I just wanted to say that uh, we uh, always uh, think that there, there are these parts of our family history, the, 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 the genealogy uh, uh, that is connected with our ancestors can be done maybe later, if we are always in a rush. Um, we say that we don't have time for it. Now, I guess there are no excuses in most of the cases, unfortunately, fortunately for our family history. So let's uh, sum up and reconsider if we, we did it right. Yeah. Um, everything we that you remember, yeah, everything we remember, uh, everything that uh, all the information that we could have taken from our uh, ancestors. Uh, but before we uh, go and try to get any records, uh, any information from the internet, any information from our relatives. It is good to start from ourselves. What does it mean? It means that we have to organize and manage the information that we have. So, most importantly, names, surnames, important days from your life, the life of your ancestors, the place where they live, what do they did uh, uh, in the past. So, what were their, their occupation? These are basically five of the most important information that will give you the uh, give you the main uh, directories on where to search for your family information. Yeah, summarizing these five, it's really important to know the surnames, especially as for the women, uh, to know their maiden names. Of course, this is something that is always worth to be put in the genealogical information. Yeah, so this is the first five things that are really really important and will give you the guidelines on how to search further in the Polish archives, Polish online uh, databases, yeah? Uh, as, as, uh, just coming back to the dates, uh, it's really important uh, that we don't have to know like the exact date and an hour of when our ancestors were born, got married or died. Um, even the range of the years, uh, it's really important and will narrow down our future research. Yeah, so so even that. So you, we don't have to be very you know strict as for the any genealogical information because any genealogical information can be confirmed. Okay, so these five facts: summing up names, surnames, dates from your life, uh, when they graduated, for example, where they having the biggest trips of their lives, where they live even uh, just briefly uh, the description of how where they lived and what they did uh, in the past so what they were doing for a living okay so uh, a tricky thing about polish research languages due to uh, the fact that the most of the immigration ha was happening during the partition of poland um, all the ancestors from that time, our ancestors from that time, could have spoken in actually three languages. That could have been Polish, German, and Russian. Which is even more tricky, uh, you, the records that were produced based on the lives of your ancestors were also uh, additionally been uh, created in Latin and in, um, in Latin, uh, this is what I said, so German, Polish, 
Russian, Latin, ah, yeah, so they are the four main languages. So, so these are, this is probably the languages that you might, you may um, uh, encounter while your family research, yeah? So, uh, this is also the, the languages that they spoke after they emigrated. Uh, this is also a great guide on where did they live in Poland, yeah? yeah? Because if they, for example, uh, spoke uh, in Russian, it is, it is there is a high possibility that they actually lived in the Russian part, part of uh, Poland, Polish partitions, yeah? So we're narrowing down, knowing the language, we're narrowing down the area where they could live. We don't know the precise location. Okay, so once we establish the information that we have, uh, once we get to know more or less of what languages your uh, ancestors spoke, we have to definitely speak with our relatives who may know more, who may, may remember now, and uh, with the ones who can share the information about the ancestry that we don't have. And what is that? That may, may be a quite simple sentence, but uh, do it do it while it's time, while there is still someone to ask him. Yeah? And many of people who are coming in and asking us for the assistance for help. As for the uh, Polish genealogy, they um, they always say that uh, there were people who they could have asked about the really simple things about their common ancestry, but they uh, simply uh, didn't have like they haven't asked when these people were still living, yeah, and they really regret that they didn't ask uh, when that was the time to do it. So, uh, if there's still somebody that you can interview in your family, please do. Uh, if, uh, if there's someone uh, that could have simply uh, left some documentation behind after they passed away, it's always worth to look into it if there is a chance to do so. So I really encourage you to do that. And like, if you are, as you can see on that map, uh, we all probably remember the stories that our um, grandparents were telling us during the Christmas. Now you know that the, the, like, these were really precious stories and precious time. And we would really better to see our um, grand, granny's stories, grandpa's stories, tell them this way. Yeah, <laughs> so I really like this kind of this cat man, actually. Uh, and what is really important by the occasion of that beautiful picture, uh, the responsibility of gathering family information is not only lying on uh, in the position of people who are hearing them, but also the ones who are telling these stories. Yeah. So, what you can do if there is nobody to ask, but there are many, many people who you can pass this information to you should be the one who will take that down before the youngers will get, get to the point that they regret that they didn't, didn't listen to you. Yeah. So there is something, there's always something that you can do to save this family history. And this is what I really, really uh, recommend. Okay, we'll get to another slide. Oh, they can still hear me and see me. Just a second, we have one technical uh, problem, but I hope it's solved now. Okay, so remember, uh, this is not just you who are uh, taking the notes uh, and listen to others, but you can also write your family history. Okay, so um, in the times of internet and computers, it's not always that we uh, have time to take notes, to uh, write about our family history. What is really important, you can simply record that. 
Yeah, there are many, many occasions. Even now, when we are basically all locked down, we can still record the stories. Yeah. So uh, when there will be a proper time to do it again, uh, you can come back to these stories and take the information that you need from them. This is one thing, and the other thing that it's really amazing how how quickly we forget how the voice uh, of our ancestors' relatives sounded, and this is a really uh, really heart warming and really lovely souvenir after our relatives. So I really I recommend you to record our relatives, especially uh, when they have really nice family stories to tell. Okay, so uh, if we have managed our family information, so we have a, a basic information for our genealogical tree. If we have made an interviews, uh, if we did an interviews with our relatives, with everyone who can give us the family information, it's time to organize our family archives. It may be at your home, it may be at your grandparents' houses. Uh, so um, basically, uh, these are all the records that they may store. And what is, why this is important? Many of people who, are who we are talking with and they're beginning with their ancestry uh, with digging in the family history. Uh, it turns out after some time of the research that they already had some information and they forgot about it, for example, or they just found out that in their family archives they have this information that we are now looking for yet. So uh, it's better to check before you start with online research or archival research, it's better to check first if you already have this information, yeah? So what information can be stored in the family archives? So birth, marriage, death certificates, of course, school records, work certificates, documentation regarding ownership, because as you know, genealogically practical also. Uh, what else can be there? Documentation, uh, such as if you're lacking, of course, letters and diaries, uh, which are really, really, um, really, really important and really rare uh, nowadays. Uh, and of course, if you're, uh, that's, that's quite natural, if your ancestor emigrated from Poland, there has to be some sort of immigration record, so ship manifest, naturalization, declaration of intent or passports. So I do believe that what you can find in your family archives, as you can see, we have here the example of uh, baptismal uh, certificate that you can find in, that can be found with many immigrants that came to America. And for example, when they were um, getting married, they have to show the birth certificate. Yeah, and in the beginning of uh, 20th century, this is probably what they had to have. And this is how the uh, proper um, certificate could have looked like it. Yeah, this is the confirmation of the birth. So we have uh, the Latin uh, birth certificate, the birth entry from the uh, Roman Catholic uh, Church, where we have name, parents, and so on and so forth. This is a really important document because it shows us the location, because all the parts here are showing the particular village, parish, county, and the um, diocese that the person was coming from. So this is really, really important. You can have it in your family archive, especially outside of Poland. What else? This is a bit more 20th century um, uh, extract from the uh, birth act, yeah, from the civil office, where you can have also the basic information about where it was issued, um, about whom, about the parents, uh, and again, uh, that sort of records, uh, extracts were being um, taken from the offices, especially before the marriage. Okay, another document. This is more so-called after the 1950s uh, records from the civil offices that may have been also a um, India. Um, on the shelves of your ancestors. Um, as you can see, this is the extract from the civil office of the birth, 
feedback work from Henrik Rutomirski. Uh, you, could, you also have here the proper date of the issuing of this document, uh, the stamp, um, and the basic information about the person. Yeah. So this is this is something that can be found in your family archives when somebody was coming, especially abroad, and needed that for marriage proposals. Okay, uh, what, what else? Here we have a, a major, uh, major uh, certificate, yes, yeah? so one, once the person was uh, graduating from the uh, high school before going to the studies, this is the uh, final uh, exam uh, certificate that includes a pretty nice thing because uh, you can also see the, the photos of our ancestors that can be um, still uh, available also. That, that sort of certificate are available in uh, state archives as well and not all of us know about it but these are still accessible. But nevertheless, uh, if that was important for your ancestors, he or she could have taken that with them when they were emigrating outside of Poland. Yeah. What else can be found? Oh, yeah, the uh, certificates of the ownership. So uh, there are actually many places that people are coming for our assistance uh, to solve that kind of cases when uh, because you know like the most precious the most valuable thing uh, for people back in 19th century when they were coming out of poland sometimes leaving everything was the land so uh, that is actually a good question for yourself did your ancestor have land own land before they came to us these kind of documentation also gives a lot of a lot of information about the family and gives you the insight of you know because basing on what they have we can just imagine how they live in back in Poland yes yeah? so this is a really really interesting thing and coming back to Poland coming for trips and hopefully uh, well back to the year uh, these days when I travel easily uh, you can also actually see the places that they own back then, yeah, because it's possible to be located. Uh, what else? Uh, of course, uh, in your uh, in your family archive, uh, you will also find, or if not in the archive, then on the Ellie's Island, for example, with the ship manifest. So the documentation that was proving their travel from Poland to uh, or so called Poland to um, to the other lands mm, and there are also very important information especially a column regarding the place from where they were emigrated and who stayed um, in the location from they were traveling from yeah so in most of the cases we are finding here there uh, the parent or the, any other relative and even the full address <clears throat> from where the person was emigrating, so also a really, really important plus. Not not mentioning the physical, um, the physical um, description, so how high they were, uh, what was uh, the color of the their eye, or for example their um, their hair. So uh, many, many interesting facts, and most of all the location from where from where they were coming from. Okay, so uh, this is a here on the slide. You can see the example of the passport, but this is the, uh, this is of course in a, um, uh, in a Poland in, in the independent Poland uh, time, so after the 1918. Um, and of course, when you would travel, you have to have some proof of identity. Uh, passports can be still, or application for the passports can be still found in the state archives in Poland uh, uh, and of course many of uh, many people uh, being in America and Canada, Australia and so on and so forth they were trying if after some time they're trying to get uh, naturalized and get foreign passports so in these kind of documentation you can also find a lot of important 
information, location, parents, uh, date of birth, uh, and so on and so forth. So again, information that will help you locate the document in the Polish archives. Okay, so names and location. Uh, I am from what I was heard. I am who I was written. So this is really important for you uh, to understand and to know because in many documents they are coming from uh, the places to which uh, the uh, ancestors traveled to or emigrated uh, have a different spelling of the names of these locations. Yeah, so basically. Um, when we see them, it may mean something else, or uh, it may be uh, written uh, with mistakes because basically the person who was writing down the location wrote that as they heard it. Yeah, so uh, they could have made a mistake, especially with Polish language, as you can believe. Uh, so it's always worth to compare the name of the location on different documents and then try to check it on the Polish maps or with the Google simply. Uh, so that's the one thing. Really important fact is that in many cases when our ancestors were traveling away from Poland, they were given not the name of the location when they were living exactly, but for example the name of the of the nearest biggest city they were living by, yeah, or the name of this whole county, uh, so-called so Powiat. Uh, because that was much easier for them to pass, for example, to the officers who were writing down the information about them. So that's important to remember, yeah, like not to stick to the one name of the location, yeah, because it may be just the area where the person was living, where our ancestor was living in. It's really uh, important to remember, yeah, and then be open to consider other locations, especially uh, in many cases, the name of the location um, in Poland may, um, may be a name basically of, for example, 20 or 30, uh, uh, the, exactly the same named location in Poland. So, uh, so it's really important to, uh, to remember, uh, remember that about it that this location Cannot, can be actually different as you saw in, for example, the ship market, and it's worth to compare them in, with different documents. Okay, so once we started from ourselves, so we've written down what we remember, then we uh, interviewed our uh, family relatives. We recorded them, of course, we took the notes, uh, we pu were putting everything uh, into computer. Uh, and uh, oh, I just almost forgot, so after we also uh, spent some time with our family archives and we got the information from there, it's good to organize them for, from the very beginning in one program within one file, yeah, so to make it easier to uh, import, export to different kind of software, that's why we need a GetCom file. And the get file is basically genealogical data communication. Yeah? So this is the format of the file that helps us to exchange data between different genealogical software portals programs. Because once you, uh, once you save uh, your family information that you do on your computer on one of the portals, genealogical portals, uh, in one file, getcom file, you will be able to move this information from one place to another, avoiding entering the same information in another portals or genealogical tree builders programs. Yeah, so it's really important to the to do your family tree, to start your family tree, to start your family uh, journey uh, with with one getcom file that you will constantly uh, grow with new information. And, but, so, being still with organizing your information, there are physical, more physical uh, objects uh, that will give you the family information. So, of course, old family photos. What is really important about old family photos? Uh, first of all, that we still have them, of course. Um, and the second of all, that uh, 
it's really sad to see that many of the photos that we have are not signed. We have no idea who's there. Uh, and that's why in 20 years time, 50 years time, 100 years time, uh, these photos that we might have in these photo albums uh, won't be of any value for future generations because they won't identify themselves with these photos, yeah, which are a true treasure, yeah. Um, so what is really important, especially now when you're staying at home, take a really soft pencil and write down free information on the back of your uh photos family photos so who's on the photo where it was taken and when it was taken even more or less of course if you know that if you don't know you have to go to the previous uh subjects of the work that, that i was telling you about during this presentation so you have to talk with your relatives if they know who's on the picture just imagine that that the picture that you can see here on the presentation of these boys, these lovely boys and the girl, um, they seem that they're quite mad. You know why? Because somebody threw out this lovely photo and we bought it, me and Carolina, we bought it in one of the bookstores for like one zlot or something like that because it was thrown away. Uh, because probably it has no value for the person who had it because they didn't know who's on the photo. Yeah, but it was pretty lovely. We're still hoping that one day we'll find somebody who is connected with that people on this photo so we can give it to the family. But nevertheless, really be careful with your family photos and save them from oblivion, I would say. So be staying at home, again, please do uh, sign uh, and write on the back of the photo or under a photo in the photo albums who's on the photo, when it was taken and where it was taken, if you know it. Okay, another slide with, uh, with the photos. Again, here are the photos that we bought from the bookstore that they were no longer of value for anyone. And for example, this beautiful photo on the right uh, the photo, the marriage photo, it was taken in Chicago. Uh, by the way, so if any from, of you from Chicago recognize it's their family here on the photo, then you're welcome to get that photo. Okay, so uh, once we go through um, family archive, our relatives, our family information that we remember, we organized it in the get file. Uh, we also took care of our uh, family photos, uh, family graves. This is another subject, really important one, because sometimes when you cannot find the information in the documents, in your memory, uh, in the memory of your relatives, that can these information found on the graves. And the, in, in case of the Polish cemeteries, uh, Polish gravestones, uh, in many cases, they uh, include quite valuable information. Uh, among others, we can find their, the birth dates, the death dates. In many cases, we can also find out who this person were, their occupation, class, even the photos. Yeah? So sometimes if you think you uh, already use all the sources and you don't know where to find any information on your ancestors, the family graves, especially the one on the Polish cemeteries, can give you that information. There are even online databases uh, that are storing the entries about the people who are buried in all Poland. That's uh, probably subject for the, another webinar, but this is something also available that you may use in your family ancestry uh, research. Yeah. So, uh, so yeah, so uh, graves as another uh, place that we can find the information. But all this information, when we are still in our houses outside of Poland, especially, all this information, ancestral data, uh, and what we will find in the future is all connected with the location. Location is the key. So, to tell you more or less how the documents are stored in Poland, we have to distinguish two, uh, two, two areas. So the state administration and the church administration, yeah? 
So based on the location, we'll be looking for particular names and particular names of the parishes, of the communities, of the archives uh, within the 16 provinces that we have nowadays in Poland, and 44 dioceses if you were of uh, Christian, uh, Christian um, religion. Uh, which is the, the the majority nowadays in Poland. So so basically, this is worth to remember that we'll have state archives and church archives, so diocese archives and parish archives. But to be more concrete on that, uh, let's see. This is how the Poland looks like nowadays. Um, so you can see these sixteen provinces. Uh, each province has the main city of the province, and this is probably where the information on your ancestors will be stored depending from which province the ancestor came from yeah for example in my case i know that some of my ancestors were born around krakow uh, so uh, i will be looking for the information uh, in krakow state archives yeah because basically the whole polish archival system is based on the, the um, on the uh, Terror, uh, on the uh, on the rule uh, on how basically the the records are stored in a place uh, where they were issued. Yeah, so this is where we will be looking for your ancestors' records. And so, like uh, being more uh, specific, uh, in as uh, the state archives in every bigger city, uh, you can find the rec the following records. So documentation regardless of the religion. So there will be a documentation about the Christian, but also about the uh, Jewish uh, communities, uh, evangelic uh, ones, uh, so on and so on and so forth, regardless of the religion. Acts of civil status, sentences, address books, court documentation, military records, voters, and so on, and much, much more. As for the church archives, these are uh, archives will have most uh, importantly metrics, so birth, marriages, deaths, among others, but these are the, the basic ones. Uh, and uh, these are the, distinguished into two types, so the parish archives and diocesan or archdiocesan archives. Yeah? In the uh, diocesan archdiocesan archives, we will get the copies from the parish, which is also important, and in the parish we will get the original uh, birth, marriage and death certificates of our uh, ancestors. And the metrics, so the, our primary source of knowledge. So within the records, so metrical records, we can distinguish baptism, marriages, deaths, and alagata. That's quite interesting because in most of the cases, you are, are asking for these three types of the metrical records. While yes, the alagatas are quite interesting ones because before the marriage, um, back then, even now, and of course nowadays, you have to deliver the uh, certificate of birth uh, of, or uh, baptism in case of uh, Christian records, yeah. So, um, so uh, th this, is, this is a really interesting source of knowledge, the other gather. So these are all records that you have to deliver before the marriage, yeah, and this is something, you know, this is aside the marriage and uh, baptism records uh, and give you the other you may give you the additional information on your ancestors that you won't find in neither in birth marriage or death records yeah so it's worth to explore and sometimes you are not able be, uh, to find some birth records because for example they were uh, burned in fire or uh, they simply got lost and then you can check if there are alagata that are available for these particular parish or registry or community, uh, because they may have, they may include the birth information or even the birth certificate. Yeah, so nothing is lost. Here we have the example of uh, Latin of Galician birth record. Uh, uh, baptism records, to be exact, there is a birth uh, date as well. Yeah. Then we have uh, the example of the Latin Galician um, marriage record. We have the information about the uh, newlyweds, 
about their age, about the house numbers, parents, uh, birth dates, uh, and the date of the marriage, of course, and many, many more uh, interesting information. It's really, uh, you're being lucky if you have ancestors from Galicia because the records are including really a lot of information, especially if the authors or the, uh, the press was detailed enough uh, to write that all down. Then uh, we have uh, the example of um, death record. Uh, this is uh, also to, of course, this is, uh, in every case, this is a really sad part of our family history, but also very natural. And um, it may also give you the insight of how they lived yeah? mm -hmm. and how, what they were coming through uh, during the, their life. So uh, this is the example of the uh, Latin and Galician uh, death metric. Then uh, this is a really nicely written Polish um, um, in Polish a metric the birth record from a Polish kingdom partition of, of Poland. Uh, this one is, uh, let me check, uh, from 1856, from the year of 1856. This is the birth record of, uh, let me check that again, uh, of, oh gosh, what is the first name? Franciszek, Francis, yeah. So this is a really nicely written record in Polish. Um, uh, this is a different uh, form than the uh, Galician records, uh, although this is, uh, uh, again, this is a kind of a form, so every birth, marriage and death record will have the information about your ancestors more or less in the same places. So if you, first of all, get to know Polish and get to know where the information um, located within the record, then it, it's getting easy to, to be read, yeah? Uh, of course, uh, we've seen the Latin records, the Russian records, but, uh, uh, and then we have the, the, uh, the old, uh, the pre-partition uh, time records in Latin. Uh, these are the baptism, uh, baptisms. Uh, from 18th century, um, so this one is may might be uh, quite uh, tricky. Although again, these are the forms, yeah. So uh, the same, the particular information are located in the same places in every record. Uh, so to be exact, for example, here we have uh, on the right hand side um, the birth record of Margarita. It, she was the uh, daughter of Valentini and Regina Zhukovsky. Uh, so basically, as you can see in the middle of this, um, uh, of such birth record from the half of 18th uh, century, you will always have the name of the, of the baptized child and their parents, yeah. Uh, of course, this is not that easy, although do believe me that when you will read through a few hundreds of entries like that, you will get used to it and it will be quite easy to be read. And of course, um, that gives us, uh, I guess, the most of the challenge in Polish ancestry, so the Russian records written in Cyrillic alphabet. Yeah, this is the example of the birth records from the Russian partition of, uh, of Poland. So, summing up. We've gone through the uh, metrical records. Metrical records are the base of the tree, yeah? And these are the basic information that you enter into all the get files, all the family um, uh, tree portal, port portals when you're creating that. Uh, so then, um, nowadays, uh, what is really important as for the access to these records uh, is the law of the uh, personal data. In Poland. What is really important to remember, there are 100 years for births, 80 years for marriages and deaths. Uh, so basically it means that when somebody, some, when somebody was born uh, 
uh, more than 100 years ago, his birth or her birth records is being moved from uh, civil registry office to the state archives. This is the like the main rule. There are some exceptions, of course, but that may be a subject of another meeting as well. Uh, in case of marriages and death, that's just uh, 80, uh, 80 years. What is really in important, um, not all the information will be written from the original act. As for the nowadays current uh, birth, marriage and uh, death uh, extract, the records uh, from the civil registry. So it's always good to ask for the copy of the record of the original not the extract, uh, because that will give you the more insight of the uh, uh, original information that was written on your uh, ancestor, uh, ancestor uh, document. Documents on the internet. That may be a really long, long subject, but I would like to show you just a few basic bases. So, as I showed you, the, the main chain of the uh, archives in, in Poland, uh, all the information that are stored in Polish archives, um, uh, so the, how to find them, uh, it's all uh, shown on the main page, so www.szukajwarykiewak.pl. Uh, it's available in English, hopefully at least most of the content. Uh, and you can find the information on where to look uh, on your ancestors' documents. But what you have to know, that's of course the location. So uh, once you enter the location, it's supposed to show you the availability of the documentation. Uh, of course, um, it doesn't show every uh, location records because you have to know to which parish or which community or which office did the location belong to yeah? because not every not every small village had their own parish or own um, registry office uh, sometimes they belong to others so you have to know it before you start looking in the in that database but anyways uh, they have indexed everything that they have in all poland so uh, you will get to know what kind of records you can look you can look for your answers but Apart from that, of course, we're digitizing more and more records. So, uh, if there, uh, the particular parish, for example, was already digitized, the scans are available on this website, and you can view them and can find the following information there. This is the oldest, uh, the older part is the uh, mm, uh, version of this website, and now we have more newer one. Uh, and they, I guess they're moving all the software here, shukayarchiva.gov.pl. Uh, this website is also available in English, although uh, a little bit different than the other one. Uh, the search engine is a little bit different, so you have to get used to it, but I'm hoping it will be as good as the previous version of the website. You could check it yourself, as I mentioned, it's, it's in English. Okay, so one website that I would like to show you more in particular are the biggest uh, indexing project in Poland. So, Geneteka is done by Polish Genealogical uh, Society. It's the biggest one in Poland. They're indexing and digitizing the, uh, the records from whole Poland. They are cooperating with Polish State Archives as well. And nowadays uh, they have 32 million, 103 uh, 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 records from indexes from all Poland. So that, that's a quite number. And basically what I wanted to do is I would like to show you the, uh, how it works. So uh, let, me, let, me, let me show you the website. We'll do a little bit of a screen sharing. Uh, okay. So I'll show you how to find your ancestor through Geneteka and how it works. As far as I remember, it's in English as well. So it should be quite easy peasy. Okay, I already have my full screen. 
Okay. Okay, well, you will be able to see that. Okay, so here's going to take I am and the uh, website of the Polish Medical Society. And here we have the main search engine. Mm. Maybe I will close that up a little bit. Hope you can see it well. And here we have the main provinces in Poland, some of the peer city like Warsaw, and it shows how many indexes of births, deaths, and marriages uh, were, were, was done on a particular uh, area. Uh, we also, apart from Polish provinces, what is really important, we, they have also Ukraine, Belarus, Lithuania, uh, as they were the former, the parts of it that were uh, also uh, former Polish uh, uh, regions as well. So, what we have surname, uh, we may check uh, if there we're looking at, in what, way, in what we are looking at, especially for the marriages, we could check uh, both uh, the spouse, uh, uh, both spouses' uh, surnames, but if we're looking for a particular code, we can enter here with something. Um, just one person, yeah. So let's uh, let's search for I don't know, Schleusak, our friend uh, Carolina. Oh my God, surname. There, there is a place just for surnames, not for, mm -hmm. um, not for the first name. And let's uh, check between eighteen seventy and. 80, 80, 90. <clears throat> okay. So, what is really important about the data database and why uh, is it worth to, to be searched from the very beginning? Because if you don't know the location, it can show you how the uh, surnames are located in Poland, for example. Yeah? Because and where are the records on particular surname? So that maybe give you even the idea where to look if you have no idea where to look at all. Uh, so that's why we will check uh, what are the indexes for surname search and from which part in Poland. Let us search Schlendark. Okay, so we have the particular results. Oh, I hope that you can see that well. Uh, we have... Um, Quite many results, as you can see, from Świętokrzyskie region. That is more in central Poland. And we have 308, the most of the births from that region, 72 deaths and 14 marriages. And as I know from the background uh, that Karolina is coming from the central Poland, so this is the exact, it shows the exact place where you have to, or she has to look for her ancestors. Yeah, and see, let's see the births. What do we have there? 308 births. Okay, so as you can see, we have the list of all people who uh, was born within that parish, um, within, sorry, within that region, and what kind of information were indexed. So we have a year, the record no, number, name, surname, father's name, mother's name, mother's surname, parish, place, and remarks. Yeah. So uh, uh, this, this is really important. So we have a particular places, parishes. Uh, the, these are the lots of uh, uh, genealogy information that we can already use. But what is really important? And uh, by the end of that um, table, uh, in the last column, if there is a and, uh, there is a uh, button uh, with the uh, word scan, which is like English scan, but we see, uh, of course, then it will take us to the website with this particular record. So when I click it, I will have to choose because I know the record number, I will have to choose the particular record number from the year that I was looking for that and I will get the uh, particular record, yeah? So this one are in Russian, so that's another obstacle for another woman, but still, here are the uh, original uh, records available on the website that is provided by the this portal, yeah? 
Okay, so let's go back here. So we have the verbs. We have also marriages. Okay, as you can see, uh, very detailed information as well. We have again year record name, surname, parents, surname of the bride, parents of the uh, of the groom, parents, parish, and also remarks. And again, if there is a scan available on the other websites, uh, it is uh, posted. The information is here, so highly. I recommend to use that website uh, to see uh, where the ancestor, maybe you know the ancestor that you are looking for for a long time, you got to the brick wall, um, maybe you'll find them just, <clears throat> you know, um, uh, just by the chance of visiting this website, yeah? It is uh, really uh, worth to check uh, to see if they have uh, your ancestry information on that website. <clears throat> of course, when you will get to the particular uh, provinces, you can uh, look for a specific parish within the, um, the chosen region. So, and they are also showing you uh, for which, uh, uh, what range of years they are, they have the indexes for particular parish, yeah? And they are in the alphabetical order, so it's easy to choose. And when you are in particular, when you are searching in particular area region, you can also add first name here. Uh, you can do the exact research. You can skip search patterns home, for example, and so on. There, so there are many, many options to make it more valuable. Okay, so uh, definitely, I recommend to see this website when you're looking for advances, so if you don't know where they are coming from. You know, they got lost in your family history. Uh, this is that may be the answer to your questions. Okay, but let's go back to our presentation. Okay, hope you can still see me and hear me. Um, so we had Genebeka. Mm, uh, the other, of course, apart from the whole Poland databases, we also have the more regional ones, yeah. So uh, what I can say that the north of Poland is really quite nice index, and uh, uh, there are many online databases that you can use if you have um, ancestors from central or northern Poland. The southern is still in progress. There are less uh, databases that you can use, but uh, again. This is the huge process, so, so no wonder that uh, not all the regions are covered with uh, digitalization and the indexation process. Um, that well as the north and the central one. But uh, in case of uh, Greater Poland region, uh, so Wielkopolska, um, uh, you can uh, look at the Posen project, marriages project. This is one of the oldest uh, and the biggest uh, projects in Poland, genealogical projects in Poland, you can look for that. There are almost all marriages from the Kopolska uh, until the year 1989 uh, index, from the whole 19th century basically. They are indexed and available and you can even uh, check uh, where the documentation for the proper parish are stored because when you will enter the surnames you will get the information on the the bride on the room, they near the age, their parents, uh, plus uh, the uh, entry number, the year that the, the marriage was taken, uh, and the information about the parish. When you click on the information, uh, the name of the parish, you will get the proper um, details on where the records from that particular parish are stored and for what. Uh, uh, range of years. So I really highly recommend that and um, you are very lucky if you have ancestors from that part of Poland, so Wielkopolska. Uh, uh, another one also North Poland, uh, that's from a Romanian General Logical Association. And what I forgot, I am presenting you the databases that are also available in English, so uh, English friendly, so to call it. Uh, that one, the Pomeranian, Pomeranian one, um, is also a very nice index. They have uh, the uh, direct links to the scan documents as well. 
so many many information uh, about the whole Pomeranian area and index and scan entries from here. And then maybe somebody wants to know the uh, address of the website is here. Um, okay. So, uh, same situation uh, also available uh, in English. Um, the Częstochowa, so Central Poland uh, records and uh, information on what is available and, and what is stored. Uh, so, more of a Central Poland, they have 1,329,984 records available, indexes, sorry, available. So uh, if you have access to the Java region, that is worth to be checked too. Uh, another really, uh, uh, really uh, huge database. Uh, these are uh, uh, the records from Lugansk uh, portal, the records from the uh, Eastern part of Poland. Uh, they have uh, 7,568,000, uh, uh, oh my gosh, okay, so around 8 million index records uh, on, uh, on the website and they're very tall, uh, so if you have ancestral from that part of Poland, uh, Lublin area, uh, we really highly recommend to research that uh, database, so I'm sure that you'll find a lot of uh, in a lot of uh, in, important and valuable information, uh, so it's worth to be noted. Okay, so uh, as you can imagine, I could I can talk about genealogy for hours, and we can simply divide every little subject into a huge webinar. Like we can extract every little subject that I was trying to. Um, uh, tell you about into a individual uh, webinar, but and presentation. But we are uh, we are a little bit time limited. I just wanted to give you a little bit of the insight of how to start, of which uh, which are the most important websites for Polish genealogy, and what are the steps that you have to take before you will dig into the archives after they're open again and before you will uh, start to dig within the actual documents, yeah. Hopefully that was um, helpful for you and you had some nice time with me. It was really uh, difficult to talk to yourself only without any, um, without any voices from the other side, you know. Uh, but hopefully that it will change soon. Um, hopefully, of course, also if you have uh, you have many uh, questions, and uh, hopefully again we will be able to help you. And what I'm recommending, we have our genealogy group, Facebook group, Polish Genealogy Helper. Uh, any uh, questions that you might have on that presentation, please do post in our genealogy group, uh, Polish Genealogy Helper, and we will answer them all. So any kind of question that you have, uh, um, we will be happy to help you. So thank you very much for listening to me. Uh, uh, and uh, hopefully we will see each other, see each other. Wow, you will see me again on the next webinar. Um, it will be really great uh, to share our knowledge and our experience with you in that circumstances when we cannot do it any other way, basically. Have a great day because most of you will have a great day. Uh, will have a day and a great day, of course, um, uh, uh, ahead of you. Uh, there is a already evening in Krakow. Um, so, what I have to say is Dobranos, maybe. Dobrego wieczora, Ruta. See you again and thank you for attending. Okay, and now I have to finish the screaming.